Hello, and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we've got another great evening for you. For those of you who are actually seeing me on video, you can see behind me, this is what we're going to be seeing. Not this in particular, but I'm going to be on the road until the, uh, well, the, let's see, the 20, I think the 19th is the last show that I'm going to have on the road. Uh, but then I go out, again. I'm going to be on the West Coast, and hopefully on the 19th, it'll be with Gary Nolan at Stanford. Uh, let's see. Um, and then I come back. I'm in town for one show and then off again to Phoenix for the MUFON boot camp. Yes, the investigative boot camp. I'm going to be involved in that. I just want to see how it works and all that. And then I'm going to be doing a show right from Phoenix with a couple of other friends added to the mix and uh, MUFON people, as well as I know uh, Matthew Roberts. I'm asking him to show up and a few other people in Phoenix. I'm going to get a group there, hopefully. So that'll be on the 19th next week. Uh, we have Dr. Bob Gross. He's going to be on. Uh, again, I'll be traveling. You'll see me in hotel rooms. And that's the way it's going to be uh, for the next few weeks. Let's see. Our uh, guest tonight, uh, Neil Nixon uh, from England. He is uh, he's a, a skeptic. He's a clear headed skeptic. And if uh, you know, we may disagree on a few things, but uh, but it'll should be a good discussion and i've never shy away from skepticism because i think that keeps the ufo field uh you know more or less straight you know i showed last week that i had um uh, what i thought at first was a ufo i filmed it this was a few weeks ago and so i put the clip out there just to get some answers from people and sent it to mark d'antonio right away he said, well, it looks like a drone. It acts like a drone. It's probably a dot, dot, dot drone. So, uh, but it did do some weird flashing. I'm going to see Mark when I'm out in Phoenix. I'm going to show it to him firsthand so we can take a look right on my phone. The whole footage, I didn't post the whole footage online. So I'm going to show him the whole footage just to get one more opinion on that. But anyway, uh, what I'm getting at is skepticism is good. And it always has uh, been good in the UFO field because, um, you know, uh, the, the saying it only takes one real UFO to change everything. So, and I do believe that's true. Like we all, that's all we really need is just one solid uh, case of evidence. And uh, it's definitely fleeting. It's hard to catch uh, the videos, uh, photos, witnesses, uh, radar evidence, but we've never had an actual UFO that we could actually walk around and kick the tires on. And hopefully, um, hopefully we'll get answers and we'll have more evidence to compel the rest of the world and uh, the rest of the people that are interested in this topic and, you know, try to figure out what on earth they are. I never say as people that know me a, a long time listeners, I never use, I never say that I know what they are, uh, whoever it is that's visiting us because I don't have a clue. And I still feel like if someone's out there and they're telling you, who and what they are for sure um, run the other way because I don't think that anyone, as far as I know, no one knows for sure exactly what they are. Possibly extraterrestrial, possibly a lot of them can be explained, but some of them can't be. And that's what we're going to be discussing a little bit of that tonight as well. The blog this week, a UFO landing and a meeting with Eisenhower, another great one. That's a very interesting story. And uh, by Charles Lear, check that out on our website, podcastufo.com. Anyone can support the show. You can do that over there as well. It's on our, our, our Patreon page is linked. And for $2 or more a month, you can help us out, help us continue. And I think uh, that seems like I had something else to say, but I can't remember what that is. So for now, I'm going to bring in our guest. Welcome to the show, Neil. Hello, Martin. Um, yeah, we will... I was just listening to your introductory remarks there, Martin. So clear-eyed skeptics. Somebody, oh, I can't remember, that was about 20 years ago. That was a book review on second UFO book I did. Somebody described me as that. So, uh, yeah, if we can agree on that, that suggests that I'm sane. So that's probably a good start, isn't it? Um, and I, yeah. I'm with you totally on, on the other thing as well, that um, one incontrovertible case would change everything. And I'd be as excited as you if that happened. I mean, it, it's... We'll explore this later on. It's scepticism in the sense that um, I'm very much of the opinion that a lot of answers that are not to do with extraterrestrials are undervalued. 
And I'm also of the opinion that some of the, the best cases, the, some of the biggest cases in the past, which crashed and burned, probably have taught us a lesson. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, we've have, I've witnessed a couple of crashing and burning, so to speak, um, on things that were to be revealed. You know, one comes quickly to mind is the so-called Roswell slides. Uh, I, you know, that was crazy. <laughs> and, you know, everyone is waiting with, you know, bated breath to see what this is. And it's a mummy. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah, a, mummy it's in a, glass a South case. American mummy. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, yeah. that was a, a shame. And as soon as I saw a clear enough picture, just from my background and all the museums I've gone to and everything, you know, I mean, just right away, it's like, oh my God, that's like a museum thing or something, you know, right mm -hmm. off the bat, uh, the clearer it got. And I, I think, you know, there were some people that made some big mistakes and there were some people that were deceiving. I think that's what that case is about. Mm -hmm. And, and some well, people it, were trying to make some money off of it. And yeah, well, a, a, a biggie for us, which um, I've got to be honest, by the time this happened, I'd, I'd seen, you know, things like MJ-12 had come and gone. So the longer you're in it, well, the longer I've been in it, the more skeptical I've got. But when the, the alien autopsy movie, the... Um, oh, yes, that's another one. Yeah, yeah. exactly. R R Ray Santilli's thing, which, which still does the rounds and it still gets shown on, um, to this day, it still gets shown on uh, like UFO documentaries. But... I yep. went to a UFO conference in Pontefract in Yorkshire. Well, Phil Mantle that you've interviewed, right? It was yep. a, one, uh, one of his conferences. And, and um, one of the star turns was the guy that hoaxed it. <laughs> um, but that was that was when they showed that. They I, The first time I saw it, it was at UFO conference in Sheffield in the, the year it came out, 1995. And it was a truly surreal experience because the guy sat like literally one seat in front of me was any British people listening in will remember Roy Hattersley that was at that point, he was the deputy leader of the opposing party in the British Parliament. Um, hmm. And there were a few odd people in the, in the, the audience. And so somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, well, I didn't know you were interested in UFOs. And he turned around and he said, well, I'm not, but I'm a journalist. As in, he couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't turn down the invitation just <laughs> in case. And I guess uh. he was about as sceptical as myself. And, he, you know, you, you do have that. I mean, you you hear stories, you hear amazing things, and I get a sense of hope as well, but it's probably not as simple as thinking, right, this is the one that's going to prove it. Right, yeah, and, you know, while we're on the alien autopsy, you know, I had Philip Mantle on the show early on, uh, you know, uh, talking about that that case and, and how he he did a lot to uncover, you know, the, the falsities in that, and uh, you know, it's the behind the scenes on what they did and then the damaged leg, how that actually was an accident and they made it look like the alien had, you know, an injury, uh, you know, all that stuff. Um, but uh, it it is convincing, you know, for if you're if you just saw that film, you would think, oh, my, you know, that that's got to be real. I can understand why people fall for that. And it is a shame when someone doesn't research. <laughs> Yeah. When they're putting together a documentary and they put that little clip in like it's something real, you know, and that it, that it, does bug me in a lot of documentaries. They'll put they'll put uh, things that are known to be fake UFOs uh, in in a documentary that has a serious um, look at UFOs. It's they, they don't yeah, do enough but, research. But there's a couple of things there. First of all, with the alien autopsy thing, I, if I'm honest, the first time I saw it, and I hadn't seen anything of it until that particular showing at the conference. Um, and there's, at one point, the word video almost appears on the screen. Yeah, it's almost like they couldn't resist putting something like that in there. Um, and so it kind of gives itself away. And there were a few, well, I'll, I'll confess, I was joining in. The, 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 there were a few suppressed laughs at that point in the audience. There were a few people at that point thought, ah, you know anything else now we're not convinced and and, and you know the, these things turn up in documentaries be, well bottom line is the, the the job of most of the documentaries that are out there and most of the channels that are screening them is to deliver an audience to the advertisers isn't it so they'll go with something that's going to get more viewers than than just something that's that's that they can prove that or that stands up to peer review because that's not their job it's 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 infotainment which is you know it's an old word now but you know the use of in, information as partly as entertainment as well so that's that's never really gone away with ufos i don't know if you had a chance to watch 
um, Channel 7, Australia's documentary on called The Phenomenon that Ross Colt had, Colt had, Hart did. Did you get a chance to watch that one? That is a very well done program. Yeah. It's free. It's free on YouTube. Three million yeah, I, views. I was, yeah. I was really, because you had him on a few weeks ago and I, I was right. really impressed. He, he's, although he's got, I, th I think you complimented him on his wonderful broadcast voice, didn't you, at one point? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You're and right. and yeah. he, he has that thing when you listen to him. He just sounds like such a smooth, consummate professional broadcaster that there's times you might disregard his journalism. But he is in that group of international investigative journalists who, um, well, currently the big story in the UK, as I'm talking to you, that they've uncovered is the thing that they're calling the Pandora Papers, where they've just, there's just, terabytes of information and millions of documents about um you know highly influential people politicians and business people and stuff like that and the money that they're moving around and the way that they're avoiding tax usually legally but quite unethically and russ Coulter oh, yes. is part of that group yes. so i, I was I mean, the, the thing i found most convincing about him was that he was basically saying at one point wasn't he that as a journalist he's involved in loads of things and he's got that prime position in australia where he's presenting that you know he's, he's presenting basically their flagship news show and yet when he was faced with all the ufo things that were coming his way a bit like alan hynek before him there came a point when he thought well this is just so bizarre and so interesting i can't deny what i'm seeing yeah yes you know, right. he did a, sorry yeah i was just gonna say he did a deep dive for two yeah. years and yeah. uh, he was even listening to my show yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, what do you mean, even? Don't underrate your show. You get, uh, you know, you, 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 you get enough good people on there that quite a few of us just download it, and you know, it'll they're quite long shows, so I can I can quite happily listen to it off and on over a week, and then get another one right. the following week. That's right. Yeah, they are pretty long. Uh, two hours. That's enough. Uh, now, one thing I I usually do right off the bat, but I didn't do this time, and that is. Uh, what got you interested in this topic to take a look at it? Oh, right. Well, there's, there's two answers to that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer that makes sense to me. Then I'll give you the answer that somebody gave me one time that made sense to them. Um, I mean, basically, I can't remember a time before I was interested in UFOs. So, um, and I think possibly it's to do with just the time in which I grew up, you know, when space was really exciting and there were a lot of stories about what might be out there in the cosmos and it wasn't really known. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember the moon landings and, and whatever. And then the other thing I think, which is central to this is that I was very interested in it. And, you know, my folks were pretty broad minded and quite encouraged me to just follow any interest I'd got. And my dad actually had a copy of flying sources of landed by George Adamski and Desmond Leslie, which he'd, he'd bought before I was born. And I read that when I was, I think 13 and that book is widely misunderstood because everybody remembers George Adamski and the whole thing about him claiming to meet somebody from Venus. But actually, if you look at the book, the bulk of the book isn't that. It's the bit that Desmond Leslie wrote. And Desmond Leslie, he's underrated. I mean, he, he didn't die that long ago. He was really old and he lived in Ireland and, and he'd done a lot of really good research. And that book was amazing because it just lined up a lot of historical mysteries, some of the stuff that still makes ancient astronauts to this day. But that book was written in 1953. So that's what got me into it. Plus, when I started buying other books, the kind of cheaper paperback things that were out in the 70s, to be brutally honest, they were all kind of luridly written. They were always vivid stories. And I mean, I know now some of the stories that are in there, things, the, the kind of go-to stories then were things like Kelly Hopkinsville and stuff. And when you read that, you know, these people in the middle of nowhere that are assaulted by aliens and then they just open up with firearms on the aliens and the aliens just keep coming so they just make a run for it i mean those those stories grabbed me and anyway years later i was i'd, I'd done a i think it was a 40 and time zone convention i'd done a talk at one of those and i i was backstage talking to somebody just you know just having a cup of coffee and just sort of saying hello to people and somebody asked me you know, how long have I been interested in UFOs? And I said, I couldn't remember a time before I was. And some total stranger who was also there having a coffee came over to me and said, well, I can explain that. He said, you were abducted as a baby. Uh, and I'm, uh -huh. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> and I don't think they'd come light years to West Cumbria, which most of your American listeners couldn't find on a map. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, who well, knows? I, well, speaking of doubtful, that, but... while we're on the while we're on this subject, since we haphazardly landed there, 
um, what is the alien, uh, you know, so so called experiencer or abduction rate like in Australia? I'm sure you're aware that it's quite high here. I mean, people claiming that they're being abducted in Australia. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, you're not in Australia. You're in Britain. <laughs> Did you just? Oh, I I've, thought I've you just mentioned in Australia. I, can ring I know you you're want, you're in the UK, but I thought you just mentioned a place in Australia. Did you not? Where you grow up? Um, Where, what did you I, I did before we came on. I, I was I was telling you that my my son and daughter in law live in Australia. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, got that. But it, uh, in England, it's you must have seen this. There is a map that shows. Um, it just basically lights up where more UFO activity has been reported. And it, it's a bit, I've seen it on the internet. I don't know who produced it, but America is on fire. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and the UK is pretty warm. So we have, uh, you know, we, we, we produce in terms of UFO sightings on a slow year, we produce maybe two or 300 on a very busy year. We produce nearer a thousand. So, if you look at us historically, some of it is quite predictable. The year that Close Encounters came out in the UK, the sightings spiked noticeably, for example. Um, in terms of abductions, we definitely have abductions. And I don't really want to go into this, but just apropos of nothing, I was shopping for UFO books in a second-hand bookshop a few weeks ago and just got talking to the other person who was in the same place took her about two minutes to tell me that she'd been abducted. Uh, I mean, no names, no pack drill here, but you know, it's, it, there are abductees and, and, and I know I put her in touch. I've no idea what went on there and I'm not making any judgments at all, but um, I kind of made contact with her and I put her in touch with the British abductee support group. And there are about 300 people in that group. Wow. So we've, we, you know, we've, we've got, the same beliefs and the same experiences reported as you will be familiar with. How about that? You know, I mean, uh, the blog this week, as I mentioned earlier, is a UFO landing and a meeting with Eisenhower. And there are some people that have carried along. I don't know if you've ever heard of the arrangement, supposedly, that was made between Eisenhower, you know, saying that uh, you can, as you give us some uh, you know, technology, new technology that we can use. And with that, you have permission to take people and experiment with them. Uh, I don't and, believe And cattle. That. And cattle, people yes. People and cattle, yeah. Uh, I'm familiar with my that My own story, opinion, yeah. um, I, I think it's a bunch of uh, baloney myself. But, you know, I mean, there are some people that think that really happened. And, uh, you know, it's 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 interesting uh, you know, that's, to say that's the a least. skeptical opinion, Martin. You'll you'll be bringing hate down on yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see what happens. But anyway, I I think that you know. I mean, I don't know what this what the answer is to all these people that are claiming these things are happening to them. I mean, uh, I do believe that they believe that something is happening to them. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of very sane people and intelligent people. That are claiming these things are are happening happening to them, and well, you introduced me as a skeptic, but that's one of the things that's kept me going all the years. As my opinions about the whole thing have changed, I mean, if you if you'd interviewed me when I was about thirteen, it was obvious everybody was reporting the truth, and anybody that denied it was narrow minded. And I've moved on a little bit since then. Um, and actually, funnily enough, it, some of the earlier books with some of the more bizarre stories in the end convinced me that they couldn't all be true. But one thing that's always kept me going is that whenever I meet people who are reporting things, and particularly with abductees, I'm absolutely convinced if you linked them up to a polygraph, it would say that they're telling you the truth. I mean, but people have real experiences and um, I'm doing a gig in like a, a speaking engagement in Essex in a few weeks time, which is another part of the UK. And I used to work there and I was in a research group for a number of years in Essex. And I remember that in terms of I, I often tell this story that in terms of just proving the sincerity of people who have experiences, I wasn't involved in the investigation on one guy that came to us, but I remember him coming. And the interesting thing, without going into the story, which resembled actually quite a famous British case, um, was that he, the first request he made to the group was that we wouldn't tell anybody. And by that, he didn't mean 
I don't want you to tell the media. The person he most wanted to keep the story from was his own wife, right? And it was to do with the fact that he was, he did a kind of manly job, like in a technical sort of area and he'd been on an emergency call out so he'd been out in the middle of the night on his own and the experience he'd had had left him so traumatized he hadn't a clue what happened to him and i don't know either but um <clears throat> you know it, for, for people listening in who are truly skeptical that as a skeptic about a lot of the cases i hear i mean no doubt people have real experiences and if you were going to gauge it really crudely in terms of how traumatic those experiences are um, I'd say the people that I've met that have had the most intense experiences, it's it's on a par with having had like a bad car accident or something. You don't forget it. The initial trauma might go away, but you can still recall it. And, you know, it's just obviously if because people in my, you know, have met me in various ways have, have known that I'm interested in, in this kind of thing they just randomly come and report if you go and talk to a group on this sort of subject somebody will come and report an experience to you um yeah you know i had a i had a holiday last week and randomly met somebody who told me a truly surreal story and absolutely no doubt he was telling me the truth as he experienced it um as to what the actual truth was and whether if you or i had been stood next to him we'd have seen the same thing that's a completely different question Yes, I, I think that's interesting because that does happen a lot where two people will be side by side. Um, you know, I've even heard of several times where someone will be right next, they'll be right next to each other and one person sees something the other person doesn't. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And this is one thing in terms of, say, the skepticism I've got. So I'm... One bunch of cases I find really interesting, perhaps more than, than most people, are you know the so-called high strangeness cases where um, people report things in good faith that just don't seem to add up in terms of the logic. So there's in the book I wrote, there's a there are two chapters. One's called Astounding Tales and one's called Cautionary Tales, right? And the Astounding Tales are things I can't easily disprove, which are amazing stories to do with ufology. And one of those is, it's probably not particularly known in America, and it's its known more in this country because it turned up in a best-selling book. And it concerns a guy called Alfred Burtu. And in 1983, Alfred Burtu, in, in August of 1983, he was fishing by a canal bank in the early hours of the morning in a place called Aldershot, which is quite a well-known town in the UK, and it's a garrison town. It's famous for its military connections and Alfred Bertu was ex-military and also he'd done things like he'd, he'd worked in you know he'd, he'd been a trapper he'd caught wild animals in the woods so he was a he was an old man but he'd had a pretty tough life he wasn't easily scared and what happened according to his report was that as he was fishing he saw a UFO land near the canal and then two beings came towards him and gestured him towards the UFO and he walked into the UFO, at which point these beings were no longer there. But he heard a voice and the voice asked him how old he was, at which point he pointed out that he was going to be 78 on his next birthday. And the voice told him that he was too old and infirm for their purposes. So he kind of walked back, started fishing again and watched the UFO take off. Now, <clears throat> that is it's surreal. I mean, you, you come light years and you can't tell a pensioner apart from a young specimen. You know, how weird is that? Yeah. Um, we could, if we were sneaking up on people now, we can tell old apart from young. I mean, these are super intelligent aliens. They can get here, but they can't do that. Um, and, but on the other hand, the, the case was dismissed as a hoax and it isn't. There's absolutely no doubt about that. He didn't live that much longer afterwards, but his wife lived a bit longer. She was adamant till the day she died as well, that he hadn't made it up and that he wasn't a publicity seeker. It had made the local paper, but the only reason it went in the local paper was that he was keen to find anybody who'd seen the thing take off because he wanted a witness that would back him up. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, he was dead by the time that it came out in um, Above Top Secret, which was a best-selling UFO book in the UK, and I think it did quite well in America. Um, but by that point, Alfred Bertu had already died. Now, he's typical of a number of kind of witnesses, and I find those cases really interesting. My guess, and it's only a guess, is that had you or I been stood next to him while he was fishing, we might have seen an old guy fall asleep. Yeah? Hmm. 
And I, I don't think we'd have seen a UFO land. And it's just to do with the kind of bizarre logic of that being kind of, it's a collision between a sort of cliched science fiction movie scene and a little bit of a, an old guy's dream, in, in my humble opinion. I mean, it, obviously, it's, it needs explaining in some way. And I think that's a likelier explanation than people traveling light years and then making a basic mistake when they get here. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's one I don't know anything about, but it, it's one that I would say um, your your idea of what happened and his idea of what happened, neither one can be proven or disproven. No, Not really. But but he's he's typical of, I think, a type of witness that's undervalued, really. Somebody who is totally sincere, um, but who tells a story that doesn't completely correspond to everybody else and yet makes total sense to them. And you can't shift them from the story because they were there and they know what happened. And I've always found those cases quite interesting. And I think, you know, when you add those up, they hint at other explanations apart from the obvious extraterrestrial abduction thing because, you know, it, it, they resemble those stories, but at the same time they have their own kind of idiosyncrasies. They have their own kind of individual elements that are not kind of logical. I mean, the Eisenhower deal, right? They didn't mm. make – I don't – I've never heard a variant of that that says, well, Eisenhower said, yeah, that's fine, but you, you can only take him if they're 70 and above, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, yeah. A, it's a bit death race, that, isn't it? But, it, you know, it, it's, um, uh, you know, so it's, it, it just, the, the, the Bertu case and, and several others I could mention, you know, they, they intrigue me for that reason because they, it suggests that we possibly have in, a lot of people have in their heads a kind of basic, ufo experience that they would expect if it ever happened to them and then that's if something triggers that that's what they actually experience or that's what they report well i i guess uh I, i'll tell you my ufo a lot of people on this show have heard it many times and it's nothing extraordinary but uh uh what happened to me was you know i was sitting in a hot tub in a carmel valley back in um I always get this wrong, 2007, and uh, the exact date or whatever, I, I don't even remember exactly where. This is in California, and something caught my eye, and so I followed watching this thing. It was a blue, like a, a perfectly shaped disc, uh, no other way to explain it. It went over my head, but quite far up. It seemed to be quite far up. Uh, nice, steady, slow. And the thing that freaked me out the most was there was absolutely no sound at all. And it just stopped. And then it went on an angle toward Monterey. And there's like a Navy training base or something. But that, you know, that didn't come to mind at the time. But all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking up at this thing and I'm thinking, what am I seeing? You know, like everything uh, in that one moment, it's like I can't explain what I'm seeing. And I, and I can't understand what technology that we would have that this was. You know, I mean, it didn't do anything extraordinary, like shooting off like most people talk about. I didn't see it land, uh, but I did. That was why I'm doing this show currently. You know, I mean, it did really interest me. Um, so there are one or two cases like that. What you're describing is an object in the sky and you're looking at it and there's nothing between you and the object. Right. Right, yeah. yeah. So, and again, I'm, I'm going to get my sceptic head on here, which will probably fire up a few of your listeners. But one thing, if you've investigated UFOs or, you know, you know anything about this, one thing that's, that's known to a, a bunch of people who've done this for a while is that it's very difficult if you see something in the air and you've got an idea of how far away it is, it's very difficult actually to estimate the distance unless there's something between you and that. And you can, mis you can misperceive it from the start. And I mean, it's, it's you know, your listeners could Google a thing called pareidolia, which is, um, yeah. it's, a, it, it's, you know, well, you know, like your mind does this and it makes the pattern. And it's funny because as I've got, particularly this year, as I've been talking about UFOs and, you know, I've been doing interviews in the UK, been the book came out in June in the UK, and then it's it's moved to America now because it came out in the uh, 1st of October in your country, the, the hard copies. And 
a couple of things just coincidentally a couple of weird things happened in terms of sightings that strange sightings i've had this year um so one of them was i was on a nature reserve not far from where i live and there was a brilliant white light up in the sky and it wasn't moving and it didn't look like a plane i mean i'm quite used to seeing planes and it just it just didn't look like anything right it just like a little white dot in the sky and it wasn't moving it just seemed to be sort of hovering there and i was with my youngest son and um i kind of pointed it out to him and i got some binoculars in a rucksack so i dropped the rucksack and got the binoculars out but i couldn't find this thing with the binoculars and when i looked it had gone and I didn't know what the hell it was I'd seen. It definitely was not a plane. It was it, it was in an area near where a flight path into London, but there weren't that many planes around. Beautifully clear sky. And it took me a while, and I'd kind of investigated a few things on this. And the what I think I saw sort of brought it home to me about the distance in the sky. I was perceiving this thing as being like way, way up in the sky, about as high as an aircraft, right? Um and it was a bird watcher. This is a nature reserve. And I got talking to a bird watcher down there who, without me going into all the details, he explained some peculiarities about that particular time, which just to do with strange weather this year in the UK. It took, it took a while for the sea to heat up. The land heated up faster than, you know, and the air currents in that area were different. And Cutting a long story short, he convinced me that what I probably saw was much lower and closer, and it was a seagull hovering. Um, and I hadn't really thought about this, and it, it led me to looking at seagulls, and I hadn't realised quite how different they all are. Yeah? I mean, as in, you know, it's, it's just... And the point being that that strikes me now as a much more logical explanation, and I had to investigate that to the point of actually realising that there are gulls of different colours, and this was probably a very white one that was facing out to sea. And I was basically looking at its bum, its, its backside with the sun on it, yeah? Um, mm. As it sort of hovered there, and it's far enough away that its wings would be kind of invisible against the sky, but the big body of it wasn't. Um, and that sort of, it just it just reminded me of how far, you know, the whole distance thing, you, you misjudge it sometimes. And then I had another weird experience a few weeks after that, just it's maybe just some thinking about ufos too much but near where i live just there are some old aircraft that fly around down here just to do with the history of the place and whatever there's one in particular which is a spitfire that we see quite a lot that flies up and down the county and it often comes quite near my home because it flies over an old airfield when it does that and i heard it coming you can the, the engine noise is is very distinctive so when you hear it you know it's it's the spitfire and I, I was just sitting out in my garden in the sun and I looked at and I saw this thing, but it wasn't flying its normal pattern. It was coming right towards me, you know, like like in a World War II movie when you see it head on before it opens up the guns. Yeah. Hmm. And it was like this thing was about to it was a long way away, but it was doing a run and it was going to come. It looked like it was coming straight over my garden, like it was going to strafe me. And I did a kind of double take for a second. And then I realized what I was looking at, which wasn't the Spitfire at all. It was a mosquito, as in the little insect. And it was about yeah. feet away from me. It was hovering over a bush in front of me. And the whole thing is that, obviously, my mind, it's the Paradelia thing. My mind had done that just in that split second, right? Um, and, you know, predictably, about 30 seconds later, the Spitfire turned up in its usual place and flew its usual course up the road. Um, but, again, it was just because I've got a certain expectation in that split second, I saw kind of what I expected to see. And the point being, they're both objects in the air. There's nothing between me and them. I'm misperceiving the distance and I'm trying to make sense of something when I do. Yeah. And that happens all the time. Yeah. No, I do agree. I mean, I don't, I can't explain that. I mean, I can't explain what I saw away in that manner, but I do agree that, you know, that what you're talking about is an instinctual thing. Basically, for our survival, how we've survived as a species by being yeah. able to identify, you know, someone that's going to, something that's going to eat us alive, you know, that type of thing. Um, so that's why our brain is constantly trying to form something into something we know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I had enough time to look at this thing and, and watch it move and, and see that it was a perfectly shaped disc. And like I said, it had like a, it looks silvery with a light blue glow over the whole thing. I've only heard one other person say, describe what they saw 
uh, similar. Mm -hmm. I've only heard one other time. Yeah. But, it, but it's a funny thing because what was probably a seagull, I had enough time to look at that, and it was a little round white ball. Well, if it was a seagull, it wasn't perfectly round, but I think my best guess is my brain made it the shape I thought it was going to be because I thought it was thousands of feet in the air. I didn't think uh -huh. it was a bird hovering over the coast. Right. Um, you know, so <laughs> I mean, we, we, get, get 12 people, show them something. You know, there are, there's lots of experiments on this. that Psychology experiments, you can show 12 people the same thing and they don't all report the same thing if you split them up and if you lead them with questions. Yeah. Yeah, that is a that is a, a big a big thing that you're mentioning as so so many different ways is when people are led or when someone, you know, um, what I've said on this show, and it's not my idea, it's um, um, other people's idea is if you do have something you see or record it as quickly as you can, you know, write it down, draw it, whatever you need to do. Here's a question for you. I'm going to put it up on, on right on the screen. And this is from Richard. Do you think that any UFOs are otherworldly devices? Mm. It's cu cutting right to the chase here. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Any UFOs? If um, the, the honest to God answer, Richard, I think you and I might agree is that we don't know. Um, so my best candidate for a UFO that is an otherworldly device is probably not one that you would think of. It's the Amua Muir object that came through the solar system back in the 2017, wasn't it? And the reason I think that is the best candidate is because Abby Loeb, who's no slouch on this, he's the uh, professor of astronomy at Harvard, so it's not a job you would get by accident, is it? Um, and uh, he wrote a book, Extraterrestrial, where he argues that. Now, if, if you Google it, he's not convinced a lot of other people but he's in pretty good company. I mean, when he's not talking about that object in the book, he mentions a few other things like the fact that he had his friend Stephen Hawking around occasionally, you know, so he was he was in quite good company. So the truth of the matter is I don't know. I think if, if you were going to go for a best case, it would be that one. And that's because it's at the moment, you can't explain it any other way, but it, it never came to earth. It just came through the solar system and passed back out of it again. All right, well, um... So right now, since you just you just call called that as one that you think is compelling, uh, what about other ones that you must have seen? Like, for instance, let's talk quickly about the three videos that the government says they that our U.S. government says they have no clue on. They're unidentified to the government. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think about those three videos? Um. I don't think you can answer that simply. So the bottom line is I'm less convinced than most people. And they, I think they're impressive. If you look at the videos, they're what you expect to see. They're the, the sort of clips that look really good on a news program. The more you read and investigate, the more you might suspect that they're not what they seem to be. So I'm not convinced they're extraterrestrial. And the main reason I'm not convinced of that is, well, there's a number of reasons if I was going to rattle them out. Number one, we've been here before. We've had the perfect case for the time and it's proven, it's not been proven. And when I was talking about this in the UK, so the, uh, my book came out 24th of June in the UK. The 25th of June was the Pentagon thing, yeah? I mean, <laughs> we, we planned the book months in advance. You don't get that lucky normally, do you? And it was all mm. over the news. So obviously I was blathering about this. If you break those videos down, there's a few things to say about them. First of all, for my when I was talking about this in the UK, I was saying, well, it most in my mind, it most resembles the 1952 sightings in Washington, which were the perfect sightings over flights of UFOs, two Saturdays running over the White House. Yeah. Um, and it's never been satisfactorily explained. But the weird thing about it is it's never recurred either. So you would suspect and also if they're going to come light years, why did they come on two consecutive Saturdays over Washington? Yeah. You know, and it just so happens your local air base is stood down as well. It's also all a bit bizarre. So I think there is something in those videos that smacks of almost the perfect case. And also bear in mind that 
there's a whole history of these you know they they, they, they they span a number of years so they've been cherry picked for the best ones um there's a book by sarah skulls called they're already here i don't know if it probably hasn't yeah. sold very well she, in america she was on she was on the show yeah right yeah. I, sorry i missed that one my bad mm -hmm. but she i'm mentioning that because she's gone into print and she makes it clear that one of those videos actually comes provably from a, a lab in Germany that is a special effects, you know, that it's, it's, it's a noted site for special effects. So in other words, her implication is that you can't trust one of those videos because it well, definitely that's, came... Well, that's, I, I don't want to call that disinformation, but that's a little bit of misinformation. Oh, and, go on then. Uh, because that, uh, that, that is partially true. Um, they had that video, um, but that's not where it originated. They had that video and they no, did release it. But, but the it version not we originate. see is where it, yeah, but the it, version it, we see is where it originated. So it's, I mean. <laughs> that's where we see it, but it did that. The government is saying that is one of their videos. They're not, I know. they're not <laughs> shying away from that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, of course it was originally, but that's not the version we're seeing. And we don't know what they did to it. And nobody's explained that. And if, if you could see the, the original and you could see their doctored version, then you'd know what was actually added, wouldn't you? And that's not been so. Would you think that so, the, hmm? do you think that our government would give their thumbs up to that video and say we don't know what it is and not say that's not our video, that's not the video we released? Well, they, they wouldn't the, do the, that. The, look, the honest to god answer to that, Martin, is I don't know and you don't know, but I could give you a reason why that might happen. Yeah, which would be to do with a number of things. So again, it's skeptical history of ufology. There are cases where, for one reason or another, UFO reports have been used by the government for various, yeah, you know, for, for for understandable purposes, which might be to the case of the Washington sightings and also. The UFO scares in the 1950s. It's it's now widely recognised that the United States, for example, was worried about development of arms in the Soviet Union and was particularly concerned about the fact that on the more rural areas of the American coast, you didn't have blanket radar coverage. So if people were watching the skies for whatever reason, it would be quite useful, right? Um, so. <sighs> It may be that what you're looking at there is cutting edge technology from Earth. I think that's quite, I mean, you know, entirely possible. Um, the US, again, you know, Phil Patton, who I don't know if you've had him on in the past, but he wrote an amazing book, um, Travels in Dreamland, about Area 51, which includes a number of frank discussions of how occasionally, covertly, cutting edge hardware was used in the United States and was actually flown within sight of other people, other pilots who had UFO sightings or, um, you know, was sometimes used to test the readiness of, of your own military, but they didn't know that they were looking at technology from the same country. Yeah. Yes. I understand and, that. I understand yeah, that. And, and like the stealth airplane for one. Yeah, that. exactly. It's, and there's a, there's a, an early test of stealth technology. Was it 1976 off Los Angeles? There was a bizarre radar report of a UFO, and it's it's now known it was an early stealth test. And the whole point was they wanted to see whether by flying it in certain ways they could make it disappear from radar. Um, you know, so that so if a civilian radar reported an object that was there and then suddenly disappeared, that was actually telling them something important. And that, you know, so they tested it. <laughs> um, and and similarly, when I was first reading UFO books. It's, a standard story in the UFO books was there are objects flying so high we can't see them and so fast they can't possibly be ours, right? Now, one of the objects that was flying like that was the Blackbird. Um, and it was just, it was so far ahead as, a, as an aircraft when it was first developed. There were one or two revolutionary things about the Blackbird, which even to this day are actually a bit bizarre. So when you see it on the ground, you know, the, 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 the early seven, early 60s airplane but when you see it on the ground it the fuel just floods out of it doesn't it so when it's when it's taxiing on a runway it's pouring fuel out because it has to get up to speed for the body work to actually work properly you know it needs the heat of the and that was that was absolutely revolutionary for its time and it, it was tracked on radar and radar operators couldn't 
it obviously wasn't a missile um, and radar operators didn't know what they were seeing but the American military who were covering it up at that point were not about to tell them that it was one of theirs so if you come to the Pentagon videos, it may well be that the same thing is happening. And there is a history of this, that, that this cutting edge technology that people see and in, occasionally it's used against, you know, you, you, it, it's tested against the things that you would, your own military and your own civilian radars and whatever. Um, and another Metabunk site with one of the videos actually claimed that if you freeze frame it at the end, you can begin to see the a fighter plane shape emerging. So, no, 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 that, that's, uh, I want you to, after we're done the show, and tomorrow, I know it's very late, I want you to check out Chris Chris Lado's site, L-E-H-T-O. Okay. He definitely uh, debunks the debunking of that. And okay. so, uh, <laughs> well, and, and it's interesting, <laughs> but I do want to say, I do want to say, so what do you think about the testimony of Alex Dietrich and uh, David Fravor? on the USS Nimitz uh, case when they saw this thing visually, not only on radar, all the radar, uh, and we're talking about 1300 Gs, this thing uh, supposedly done when it dropped uh, to near just above the ocean floor. Um, uh, well, I mean, ocean. if it's doing that, it doesn't have to be piloted. So, you know, it's- Yeah, but no, we don't have any technology that would stay together with that many G force. The missiles, nothing would stay together with that G-force. We don't have any technology we know of, but when people, when radar operators were reporting something that was flying too high and fast to be a plane in the early 1960s, we didn't have any technology that would do that. We did. It's just the Blackbird was a secret. All right. Well, here's my other argument. They've been, they've been seeing these type of things and this type of reaction of craft, you know, for 70 years, you know, I mean, uh, recorded in the 1960s, uh, 25,000 miles an hour, you know, mm -hmm. an object, you know. So, I mean, I don't think that's the thing that's always gets thrown out when people are talking that this might be our technology now. Well, possibly some of it could be, but uh, they've been talking about the same, you know, uh, type of technology and uh, movements and things that defy physics for decades mm -hmm. so and you know i I've, I've talked to a lot of people i've seen some pretty strange things and again i'm not saying that i know what they are but all i'm saying it, it just seems like it would defy anything that the we could have uh for our own technology in my opinion yeah and i i don't know it, it, I'd fall back on what I said before. So, whoops, I don't know how that got up there. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, but I'd fall back on what I said before that, that it just, it, I, I'm unconvinced that this is extraterrestrial because for me, the release of this fits a pattern. The, oh, 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 okay, again, this is the American government who are releasing this, yeah? But it's, the American government are working through, I, d I don't know what you call them in, in the United States, but we have things over here called quangos, which are not quite government and they're not quite private. Yeah. It's when, you know, you, you give people a certain amount of money, you, you subcontract the job of doing an investigation. Yeah. Um, and there's this whole history of, you know, the, the, the same people, Robert Bigelow and, and you know, the, 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 the various organisations that have been there. And they're linked to this report coming out. And, you know, the, the extreme sceptical take on that. Um, Skeptoid devoted two episodes, didn't they, to the whole history of the, the, the different groups that they've had and the, and the years in which they've operated and the way people like Hal put off and you know, Jacques Vallée and, and people like that have contributed to it. Um, and it's come from that source. So it's not, whilst whilst there are senators and people in your government who want this information out there, um, the people collating it recently have been, by and large, have been in a particular mindset. So th these are the greatest hits that they've put out there. It, it's And you know they're, they're not showing us a lot of other things that are a lot less conclusive and from my point of view if, if you do good investigation you add up everything you add up the stuff that you thought was and you discovered wasn't bizarre 
because that's going to teach you something as well yeah so from my point of view we have been here before because it is almost the perfect case at the perfect time yeah and we've had those um, you know the, the the washington overflights was definitely that it bear in mind the washington overflights occurred about a year after the day the earth stood still movie came out yeah yeah and, but are so are you saying our government actually faked it is that no. what you're saying no i'm trying to <laughs> no no yeah but okay the, the the report came from the it's the, the report was subcontracted it's it's a government report because they funded it not because it was government people that did it the the, the, the people the, the nine page report was was a a subcontracted job wasn't it that um you know the and it, it's those people i mentioned that have been involved in in ufo investigation for years so in a sense it's the it's the answers you would have expected them to give you and like i say it it fits a pattern where we've had you part of the history of ufology is that we've had the perfect case come forward at the perfect time so for example the mj12 documents made perfect sense in the wake of watergate and the whole idea about you know government existing in a way that it was never honest and and whatever yeah and that just crashed and burned so i we could talk around the houses on this and perhaps a better way of looking at it would be this martin if we had this conversation in three years time i wonder if anything more will have developed from those three videos or whether they will just go down in history the way the washington overflights did and mj12 did and so on and so on well according to lou elizondo there at some point um he thinks it's going to be released as a 23 minute video that actually has okay. multiple crafts and that supposedly he has some type of inside where that my, he hasn't he hasn't strayed yet but everything he said has come okay. you know come along so we'll see when that happens uh no, hopefully look, that will i would love i would love to be wrong on this one yeah Did just think about this for a second there's a certain irony in a lot of pro et people and whatever in, in ufology what they want is full disclosure the whole time yeah well if we got one bit of full disclosure and it proved that et existed it might put ufologists it might put a lot of jobbing ufologists who go and do talks and stuff out of a job uh i don't care i'll still talk about it <laughs> <laughs> well yeah but it, but it, if everybody knows what the answer is who wants to keep I on mean, talking about the possibilities I, I this is not a money thing for me it's, no, uh, no, it's a passion, and, and it's know. not. For, but I, I do understand there are some circuit people, and there are people that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but it might it might take a lot of the business out of it, um, and and I'm not. That sounds a bit facetious, but you know, I've I've been following this for long enough, and talking about it, and and going to conferences, and, and all the things that people should be doing if they want to get involved in it, um, and it's blindingly obvious to me i mean my academic background was teaching people to write for a living and you know media and getting them into those areas so you see how culture in inverted commas develops and it's blindingly bloody obvious that that ufos and the whole reality of ufos has developed along with time and belief systems and everything like that and that, that's inescapable and a lot of what people talk about and a lot of what people pay to consume is to do with certain fashionable things yeah so you would be struggling now george adamski coming back now and saying well actually i met a guy from venus i think he's on a loser isn't it yeah yeah well he was yeah. milking it in the that 50s, was but, yeah i yeah. mean yeah you know there's enough out there about him but it's time for us to go into break we have a four minute break and this is one of the uh recordings uh, i've been getting a lot of recordings for for uh, some great ufo sightings coming up and this one here is by Tony. He's a flight controller just outside of Detroit. And for those of you over at KGRA Radio, we'll be right back right after these messages. All righty, I have Tony on the line. Tony, welcome. Hi there, Martin. Um, now, you sent me an email saying you had a strange UFO uh, sighting. And yeah. it's, it's one that... Uh, it, it's so bizarre because a few days ago, someone wrote me um, that's in the military that said they had a cylinder, vertical cylinder. 
sighting, just like what you're talking about. But let's go into the details. Uh, what, uh, when did, how long ago did this happen and where and all that, all that? This was in March of uh, 2018 is when it happened. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, months passed before I ever reported that to MUFON or anything. I never even researched it. It just, it bothered me that I didn't know what I saw that day. I, I looked at it myself and a coworker through binoculars and couldn't understand what we were looking at. Now I should, I should point out to the person watching on, on YouTube or Facebook or wherever it is that this is a picture of something you found that looked very similar, but did you not have a chance to take a picture of it when you saw it or was it so small you could only see it in the binoculars? Yeah, absolutely. It was so, it was, it was probably, my guess is somewhere around 20,000 feet at altitude. It was, it was up there a little ways. My phone, I did take some pictures with my phone, but the image, it, at that point, it just looks like a star. It, oh, it gave off oh. so much light, so much glint, uh, that it, it, it that's basically all it showed up as on my phone. What time of day? or Was it in uh, the evening? Nope, 2.30 in the afternoon, broad daylight, uh, aircraft landing at Metro Airport directly underneath it. But the facility, I'm a plant manager at a facility about four miles from uh, Metro Airport in Detroit. And the airport's actually in Romulus. And uh, it was directly over top of landing aircraft. Um, I watched it come from the north, slowly make a, a heading kind of southwest. And I, I, we watched this thing for probably 30 minutes. Huh. And I, I stared out at it out, out my office window originally. And I, I just couldn't understand what I was looking at. So I grabbed my binoculars and I keep next to my desk and walked out took a look at it co-worker came over he was looking at it with me and i remember putting the binoculars multiple times to my eyes and i just kept putting them down going what if i didn't understand what i was seeing it, it made no sense to me because the wind was blowing directly to the east the aircraft were landing into the wind heading west and when they do that they pass directly over our facility and i couldn't we, we both couldn't understand what we were seeing and, and it looked fairly large. It looked like it may have been, my guess is a hundred foot in length at least. Oh, so that's probably not a typical balloon. Uh, one last thing. Do you think the airplanes that were landing actually saw this thing? Oh, ab so absolutely. Yep. And ab it was much higher in altitude, but I bet they saw it. And what I didn't add in was there was, uh, once I took down the binoculars when it was almost directly over our facility, at probably 20,000 feet in altitude, there was an F-16 that flew right next to it from huh. the north to the south. And I watched that thing go out to the south, F-16, until I couldn't see it anymore. And it passed right next to it. So something was interested in what that was. Yeah, interesting. Well, thank you so much, Tony. No problem. I appreciate that. No problem. Stand by, Martin. In three, two, one, go. All right. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Martin Willis, and my guest tonight is Neil Nixon. And going to bring him right back in. I think I am. Here he is. <laughs> Hi. Right, welcome back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I have the feeling that so... For the most part, um, I, it seems like you've really looked pretty deeply into the topic. But what do you make of things like the Ariel School incident? Sorry, are you familiar with the Ariel School incident? What the one in in Africa? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I I don't know. So you you're right in terms of looking into it deeply. Um, I've probably looked way more into kind of the psychological sociological all the other explanations that people tend not to touch on very much and i've got a few kind of things that i've you know my own kind of insights into it which aren't in the literature and you know which i'll eventually get around to writing up but um that one very much resembles a case in the uk and again 
let, let's be clear about this because Alan Hynek said the same thing that we don't by and large we don't study UFOs we study reports of UFOs right um, that's one of the more convincing ones there is a school report from Wales in this country which is very very similar where a lot fewer children saw something land and were again quite rightly sort of separated and asked to draw it and came up with very very similar drawings and I I don't know um, at which point you're going to ask me why I'm skeptical aren't you yeah um, <laughs> I think so, you just ask yourself yeah okay, okay. <laughs> so I don't know I'm hugely intrigued kids in some ways are the best witnesses because they're often very matter of fact about things that the rest of us would find truly bizarre right so the the there are two things and this is this is my hard edited skepticism again which will wind some of your listeners up i know but there are two things that occur to me when we're dealing with these cases first of all if they're true then they're it's a one-off or it's a two-off you know and there's one or two of the cases like that so it doesn't make sense to me that all that effort from one place to another to come to us if this is space travelers just results in them presenting themselves in front of a bunch of skilled kids and disappearing again. Well, just here's, here's, my, bit... here's my on. thoughts on that. Go um, on. Who's more malleable than a young child? Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these students have claimed that they had telepathic messages to take care of the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think that's all fascinating. There's a lot of schoolyard sightings and, and also, I think whoever this is traveling, you're trying to put them in a box of how we think. This is what I see. I'm being skeptical of you because, you know, you're you're trying to whatever it is. How can they possibly think and rationalize like we do? And that's what okay, I think you're so trying to fit them in. I'm being skeptical of you then. Um, All right. <laughs> no, this is this is a proper interview. Two views colliding will. Yeah to some conclusions point counterpoint it's trotting yeah. out the the greatest hits isn't it i'm not trying to put them in a box the problem from my point of view as a, a fairly skeptically minded person who's interested in ufos is that i'm often asked questions in the context of a ufo podcast or a ufo mindset and why does it have to be to do with ufos so if i just throw out a a couple of other suggestions with regard to the school things or whatever if we assume for one second that there are truly bizarre things happening and that they've always been happening and that we experience them as extraterrestrial then it might simply be that that's the way that we understand them now and it might have nothing to do with people traveling light years so you know the whole thing about the SETI guys when they started off and, you know, Enrico Fermi's question about where are they all then if, if there's that many inhabited planets? Well, it may be that, and this is something I'd be open to, that if, if there are intelligences contacting us, they may be struggling to get in touch with us. And that's, it might not be extraterrestrials in the way that we present it, right? And in that case, who's more malleable than kids? They might all have the same experience, but what they're experiencing might be, it's almost like it might be a manifestation of something. It might be, they might be led to the experience, but actually that what's, if you and I had stood there, if you'd filmed it, you might not have seen the same thing, right? And, you know, again, more than, we, we haven't got the time to go into this, but if people wanted to Google various people, there's a guy, there's a physicist called Gerard Tuft. I mentioned his name at doing a talk once and people started laughing like it was funny, but... <laughs> he's Dutch, so it's, it's a Dutch name. He believes in a deterministic universe, basically. He's an expert on quantum theory. So he's one of these people who's open to the fact that there may be, it's almost like the universe will be leading us on and you know, the, co the cosmos is leading us and we're becoming aware at the rate at which we can be aware. And clearly we're limited by the fact that we're human beings. And it's questionable whether we're the most intelligent animals on the planet anyway. Um, but in that case his the and he's no slouch i mean he's got a nobel prize so he must know what he's doing hmm. um although he's a bit of an outlier but the 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 point is that 
he's got a quantum theory argument that begins to address something that has been addressed by people who study related things which are not to do with UFOs. So William James, I think it was 1902, his book on the um, basically the varieties of religious experience, he codified a mystical experience that far back, right? Except he was not talking about UFOs. He was talking about people who have experiences to do with God manifesting them, himself to them or, you know, th those kind of things. But the point he was making was that there's there's almost like a commonality of experience. And that is the same regardless of which God manifests himself to you or whether you're encountering a, like a nature spirit. Now, that was written in that book came out in the early years of the 20th century, half a century before, you know, we were talking about flying saucers. Those things where we might be having some kind of mystical experience and contacting something that we don't understand make more sense to me as, for example, the school sightings than intelligent aliens flying light years to land in Africa and then they'll go to Wales a bit later. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it's... If you take the if you take the experience and say, well, let's take it out of the context of UFOs for a bit. There are probably other explanations that you could apply to it. And again, I don't know. I just those are the cutting edge ideas. You know, there are one or two notable scientists, if you look into it, who are, tend to be disregarded by the UFO community. Um, Brian Josephson is another one who, having won a Nobel Prize, looked into quite mystical things. And they're uncovering amazing possibilities, which they can't prove, but they can line of logical physics that suggests that it might be and that, that that we might you know we might interpret the experiences in our own way but actually we might be being led forward the whole time okay rant over on that one well you know i i i believe that uh you you mentioned a number of times tonight that you know they've traveled light years to get here and this is just you know speculation on my point uh maybe not uh, maybe uh, it's not light years to them. Maybe let's just say I'm throwing this out there. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just throwing this out there. Say there is an advanced civil civilization that has uh, a half a billion years technology advancement on us. They've been around that long. They made it without killing themselves like we might possibly do. But uh, just say they made it through all the technology and they're so far advanced that they figured things out in physics that we couldn't even dream of. And there's mm -hmm. no such thing as, as light travel. It doesn't mean anything. They can just like, okay, I'm going to go there and they go there, you know, somehow uh, well, that we can't even imagine how they do it. So when you keep throwing out this light years away, it to us, it's light years away. Maybe it's not to wherever they're coming from somehow the way they're getting here. Um, so, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm speculating. I realize that, but um, but but maybe that's in the things you mentioned about, uh, okay, they showed up two Saturdays in a row or they showed up in a year, year anniversary. I know none of that makes any sense because well, why would they use our years and why would they use our week and why would they, you know what I mean? So, uh, well, so no, I don't but, know but, what the but, answers but, are to that. Okay, so we're not as far apart as you'd think. It's just when I speculate, I suppose it's it's, it's the career academic in me. I've spent most of my academic work in life was in what we call the humanities in the UK. Like I said, I used to teach people to write for a living. So you can't, basically, you can't have proven arguments in those areas. What you, you, you can't have deductive arguments where that plus that plus that means the following thing is definitely true. So they're always the best ampliative arguments. In, in other words, you can, you know, you can line up the most logical things you can. Now, David Clark, who's a famous British ufologist, is fond yeah, of quote. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, he mentions Occam's razor quite a lot, but Dave's a, you know, he's, he's an academic as well. And it, it's, it's kind of how we end up thinking. So because the whole thing is just massive and mystifying, the whole UFO thing is massive and mystifying. I suppose I've just defaulted over the years to, trying to use whatever logic is available and where you can line things up that make sense and you could prove them to a certain extent. That's probably the best way to go because if you gradually disassemble the whole thing and say, well, we can line all of these up and we can look in that area and we might have the beginnings of an explanation, 
then what you're left with are the true mysteries. Now, my guess is, if, let, let's just say for the sake of argument that everybody in the UFO business suddenly decided to agree with each other, yeah? It's really going to happen, isn't it? It's not going to happen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, around about the time that, you know, Donald Trump and um, Joe Biden go bowling together, probably the same day, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if they did, if, if, if some, look, if, if somebody just lined weapons up and said, right, you're going to sort this, then I think a lot of the most celebrated cases would, they'd fall apart. The ones that just get trotted out on the, you know, the, the documentaries, the, the popular documentaries and stuff. But I think we'd be left with a handful, which would not be the ones we'd necessarily expect, which would be truly, would remain truly mysterious. And so I, you know, obviously, if you do it on your own, you end up trying to make sense, trying to do that, but in a very limited way. So the whole thing about the Saturdays, when when things happen in particular times and particular places, and there might be good reasons, good human reasons for them happening, I think we have to take that into the equation. So the, the Washington sightings in 1952, unexplained, utterly bizarre, or the perfect sightings for that particular time, but they've never been repeated and they just did happen to occur on two consecutive Saturdays. Yeah. I now, think it's I, I think it's bizarre that it's ever repeated in the first place. I mean, that's one of the things that always is curious to me. Like, for instance, uh, when there's well, uh, my friend Lee Spiegel that was on last week for a little while, you know, he was told to go to North Carolina by J. Allen Hynek back in 1978 because everyone was seeing a triangle in the same place over and over again. Mm -hmm. So he flies down there and sure enough, he's with a bunch of police officers in this tr big triangle with uh, lights on the corners and one under the center comes floating right over him and shoots down a beam by his feet. Um, you know, why, why would they be in the same place? I mean, that's another big question mark. Why mm -hmm. are they, they, if they, like you said earlier, if they happen to travel light years, if that's how they got here, why would they focus on one place that's not, remarkable you know it's another question to me well, well it is but but like i said because it, the whole thing is so massive and mystifying it, it makes sense to me to kind of break things down i don't know why they'd fo focus on that place a lot of the best ufo sightings occur in the most unlikely places but you know I, if you apply a certain amount of logic well it would make sense to us that any alien race would probably be concerned about our ability to defend ourselves, therefore the military sightings, you know. But it also makes sense to me that some of the most celebrated military sightings, um, just to do with the nature of when and where they occurred, just almost, seem, you know, there seem to be plausible explanations as well. I mean, the famous one in the UK is Rendlesham Forest, which is... Right, I was going to bring that up in a minute, but go ahead, yeah. Well, it's our Roswell, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> but you and I would say, if I say it's our Roswell, you and I would say, yes, we're probably thinking totally different things, but we're saying, yes, Martin. Yeah. Um, I think it's our Roswell because it's got everything Roswell has got. Um, it's very near a military base. It's, you know, there is there is a leak of information from a significant military source, Charles Holt for um, Rendlesham Forest and Walter Hull for, for Roswell. Um, you've got eyewitnesses who totally disagree with each other. You've got multiple landing sites when people claim there was only one landing. Yeah. Um, now in Rendlesham Forest is a little bit different in the sense that you can you can visit all three landing sites in a matter of minutes because they're they're hundreds of yards apart, not the massive distances of the Roswell sites. Um, I mean, I'm. I'm a raving hypocrite where Rendlesham Forest is concerned because I've had a hunch about it for a while. Um, the sceptical explanation says that the military personnel that went, if, if your listeners are not familiar with this, really, really simply, there was a middle of the night, middle of the Christmas holidays, there were strange lights seen. You're not going to say the lighthouse, are you? That's one of the sceptical explanations. Yeah, all right. Uh, Nick Redfern went public with a book last year that basically, which which does tie up all the loose ends, to be fair to Nick Redfern, which is that um, it was a an experiment carried out by the American military on their own personnel. 
and that they gave them psychedelic drugs and led them into the experience to see how they would cope with it. Yeah. Now that makes that does tie up all the logic because that that ties up Jim Penniston who doesn't agree with Adrian Bastinza who doesn't agree with Larry Warren. Yeah. I.e. they're all tripping and they're all having their own experience. Yeah. Well, Larry Warren, it was pr it was proven that Larry Warren had was not even there. He just was repeating what he heard. You yeah. Know, I don't know if you know that part of it. But that's yeah. not new with a big UFO case either, is it? I mean, that was one of the things when we're looking at when 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 Roswell went mega in, you know, in the late 1990s. Um, I remember listening to some, I can't, it was just one of the talks that came to a conference. And I'm thinking, well, this is amazing stuff, but why didn't Jim Ragsdale see Frank? The witnesses saw a lot of the same things, but they didn't see each other. Yeah. Which All right. Is, well, let's not stare away too far from Rendlesham because I want right. yeah, so, to. So, so Rendlesham. So uh, it, it, when you boil it down, Beyond all doubt, the Holt memo is true, the thing about the lights. Um, it is unquestionable that the British police were called out in the middle of the night because some of the locals reported strange lights and the police actually attended this. And if you stand at Vic Boast's house, I mean, he's long gone, but if you stand at his house, who was one of the civilian witnesses, uh, you're only looking across one field into the forest where now the ufo trail has a cut out area of the landing site so you're practically looking at the most commonly accepted landing site um if you wanted a best guess uh, I, I wonder if they were having their christmas party the night this happened the base was having its christmas party yeah again if you look uh, for, for the room, third on the third night yes yeah, was it the third or second night i can't no, remember no. Yeah, anyway the first the, the the first night was the christmas party yeah um uh, so i don't they, think so i don't think so 26 but anyway. and 28th weren't they 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 did uh, uh, the, uh, the two nights that are, that are and it i don't know what you call it in the united states but it's boxing day in the uk the, tw the, the 26th of uh, december yeah and the, 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 most of the base personnel were at a party, so the, the actual manning of the base was down to a, a skeleton crew. You've got practically the longest night of the year. Just a guess, if you wanted to do something quite undemanding but covert, it might be a very good time to stage an operation. So, okay, at this point, two and two makes five, but it may or may not be coincident linked to the fact that not long after that we had in the uk we had cruise missiles stationed here right and it was a hugely controversial thing the american air force as part of nato put missiles in britain and these were on mobile launches so there was military sense to it because the whole point of these cruise missiles was they could go to any random launch site on any given day you would change the plans all the time so if an enemy, i.e. the Russians, had an incoming strike, was trying to take out Britain's new NATO's nuclear defence based in Britain. They wouldn't know where these missiles were going to. You could guarantee that there would be enough warning to get the missiles out of the bases, take them to their launch, launch sites that day and strike back. So it was mutually assured destruction. Now, they were in the UK not long after Rendlesham Forest. And what it was always going to be controversial, but what nobody saw coming was that we had peace camps outside the two bases where they were stationed upper he hayford and greenham common so actually there were protesters there the whole time to stop these things moving but just a guess it may well be that if you were going to test that technology and i'm not saying a nuclear missile here i'm saying just simply like if you wanted to give a test drive to one of these mobile launches then i can't think of anywhere more perfect than rendlesham forest in the middle of the christmas holidays right and if you look at the, today, there, you can walk the UFO trail today. So in other words, now in the forest, there is a tourist trail that you can walk and it goes from a car park, but the big loop covers where the American personnel apparently went, yeah? So it passes the east gate of the base, i.e. they left the base from the smaller of the two gates, went east into the forest, and then it goes out to the edge of the forest. And Rant's almost over on this, but... 
if you're looking for a plausible explanation, maybe it was nothing more complicated than they had one of these mobile launchers that they could drive out of the gate and all they wanted to do was drive it into the forest and just check the deployment. So you'd probably do it when nobody was going to see you. You'd have two or three, t you know, trusted personnel. When better to try that than when the rest of the base is having a Christmas party? Um, now, interestingly, when you walk the UFO trail, you go from the east gate, you head due east um, to the landing site. And the landing site, the one that they've, the most commonly accepted landing site from all the reports is the one that's actually, it's cut out into a big circle in the forest now as part of the tourist trail. And it's right next to the edge of the forest. So if you were going to take the quickest way to fire a missile and get it off to Russia would be to get it to the out of the east gate to the edge of the forest so that you could fire it without it hitting the trees on its way out, at which point it's just going to fly off, isn't it? I don't think anybody moved a missile. I just I just wonder if they did. They took like just basically the mobile launcher out into the forest in the middle of the night, had some technical mishap, possibly something as simple as just getting stuck in the mud, at which point they need other personnel there quite quickly and light so they can see what they're doing. And if that explains what people saw from the nearby farms that was reported to the police. Okay, well, what about the what about the tracks? It's going to leave something like that is going to be leaving big, deep tracks. But there are forestry. Uh, well, yes, but there are forestry vehicles moving around there anyway. Yeah, nobody disputes that there were other military okay. vehicles moving. What in about and out. So, what about Charles Halt's? testimony on what he saw now i've stood face to face with him and heard him tell the story and i don't believe that he's not i don't believe that he's lying when he said this thing looked like an eyeball that was kind of bouncing in the woods and dripping magma like substance and then burst into five lights you know well, that's something why did the other eyewitnesses peniston and bastinza and everybody have what they got saw they saw they were seeing something in a different area. They weren't seeing this. The Peniston saw the triangle, according to him. Um, mm -hmm. But our, when you mention the drugs or the possibility that uh, um, Nick Redfern, his idea of all the drugs, uh, are you saying or is he saying I didn't read his book that Charles Halt himself was under the influence of this also? No. <laughs> So um, what about the tape when Charles Hall was talking about this thing right over their head and beaming down the light by their feet, which he says doesn't look like a normal light, which is I always thought was interesting. Yeah, interesting. So there are a number of possibilities, okay? And again, this is, this is just me saying, well, if you can if you can perceive a human hand in this, what they're doing and why they might be doing it, then you may have an explanation, okay? There are covert operations that have been covered up with UFO stories. That's not, you know, that, 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 that's not a secret because things have been declassified later on. So I don't know, possibly, you know, possibly there's something being covered up. Charles Holt is covering that. It would be controversial and you would still, if psychedelic drugs were used on American service personnel in at the back end of 1980, these people were young then, they're only middle-aged now, yeah? You know, and where you've misused things and you might get sued, you'd probably keep quiet if you possibly could, yeah? Most cases when there's huge lawsuits coming for malpractice of any kind, if the people who are responsible can just keep kicking the can down the road, eventually a lot of the claimants will die, yeah? And then they can settle when they can afford it. And that's happened with, you know, uh, military things or whatever, yeah? Okay. Um, so I, I just think that's a possibility with, with regard to the Rendlesham Forest case. I know what you're saying about the different eyewitnesses seeing different things, but then we have the same thing with Roswell, you know, that you have a number of claimants coming forward, some of them more credible than others. They kind of agree and they kind of don't. And then when you actually look at every fact and line it up and literally do it, um, like with the Rendlesham thing, for example, if you look at it on, if you almost map it out in the forest, they don't all correspond, yeah? It's a similar story and it makes sense when you listen to one person line up one load of facts. Then somebody else comes forward and they were clearly there, but they don't quite agree. And so when that starts to happen, you wonder whether it, the whole thing is based on truth or whether actually 
um, there's another explanation, come, a much more mundane one. Well, like I've, that. that's maybe yeah. just me. Well, this is this is a case where we're, we're not we can agree to disagree. Yeah. Um, but I I I would I would never bunch Roswell or any other case in with another case myself. In other words, uh, because I don't see any comparison or any way you'd compare the two. Um, but um, we don't need to get into Roswell. You know, people are so sick of hearing. Uh, about no, it, it, it will go, it will go, no pun intended, it will go nuclear if we do, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to open the lines, and now someone did ask about this. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, David, I didn't post this up earlier, but uh, what do you think about the Phoenix Lights? I think I've seen the same documentary programs as you have. UFO Hunters did a big thing about it, didn't they? Um, there's there is one explanation to be honest I, again because it's a one-off event and it's it's you know it, it's a bit unusual and there is an explanation that that actually they're much further away than you think and they drop their flyers drop by an a a group of eight tents and there are people who've come forward to you know verify that from the military so i think that's a plausible explanation and i think it goes back to something we talked about earlier which is that um D judging distance when there's nothing between you and the object in the sky is actually very, very subjective. And a lot of people get it wrong a lot of the time. Uh, well, what about the, I have to say this about that because I, I understand part of what you're saying. And I do agree that there was flares that were dropped, but I believe those, I believe that wasn't a training exercise. I think that was to distract the public and to have a reason for all these reports, the thousands of reports that were coming in um, much earlier in the evening, starting about eight o'clock, something mm. like that, way before the flares were ever seen. Um, these people were seeing the craft go over them and miles wide. Um, yeah, yeah, but a lot of those reports came in after the lights were seen, okay? And at this point, let's go to Roswell. Sort of wind <laughs> up here, but... <laughs> Wait, let, just one second. I just want to say that um, the phone line is open. Um uh, just because you're skeptical, be a gentle person, woman or man uh, on the line. But uh, that number is 855-472-5483. If you'd like to call in, Bill is standing by. Go ahead. Sorry. No, well, just one point about Roswell. I'm old enough to have read all the UFO books that came out in the 50s and 60s, you know, when I was really, really young. They were around. Something that people forget about Roswell is it was nowhere in the UFO literature until the late 1970s, right? The thing that blew it That's open right. was the, the Charles yeah. Burlitz and Bill Moore book. And prior to that, Jesse Marcel went to the National Enquirer, didn't he, to report it about 1978. And he did this when the National Enquirer were offering $100,000 to anybody who could come up with a conclusive UFO story because Travis Walton went to them as well. And... Had he not failed the polygraph that the National Enquirer gave him, he might have been in for some of that money. Um, I know he passed a subsequent polygraph and everything, and I don't want to get into that one, but the 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 guy that did the polygraph for the National Enquirer was absolutely convinced that he wasn't telling the truth. Um, and I, I think it's significant because one thing that happens with big cases is that loads of subsequent reports come in and completely complicate them yeah certainly the case with roswell because um you know philip corso for example his entire best-selling book which sold about a million and a half copies the whole premise of that book is that he was involved after the event wasn't it yeah you know so he was involved with the dead aliens and everything like that and you know these people came forward much later and that to me is it, it just sort of beggars belief, really. How did you keep that quiet for that long? And then suddenly all these people come out of the woodwork. Well, let me ask you this. Um, and it brings me back to, we were talking just a few minutes earlier about uh, Rendlesham Forest. Have you ever spoken to someone like Charles Halt directly or Travis Walton directly or people like that? Have you spoken to them directly? <laughs> Those two, no. Someone like them, yes. And are you, uh, all right, just uh, an example of someone that you spoke to about uh, a case. Can you? Well, Whiteley Stryber, I interviewed him. Oh, Whitley Stryber. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, he was an interesting character. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't know either, does he? Um, no, I mean, crudely, I've spoken to people who've... Um, I, I've spoken to people who've had the most bizarre experiences, you know, people who've been abducted and in some cases don't want to go public with that. But I've, And I'm, I'm where I was originally. I, I think I'm convinced of the sincerity of these people reporting an experience. I'm not necessarily sure what it was that they experienced. And like I say, it's, you know, it happens to me quite a lot. You know, if, if I do a live talk or um, just occasionally, if you meet people and they know that I'm interested in this, they come and report things to me. So I've spoken to, and I don't doubt the sincerity of the witnesses. I'm just, I'm not completely sure that, to be honest, I sometimes think that ufology is not doing them any favors because I saw when I was in a research group, people would come to us with stories and they would, the investigator they would meet would sometimes be absolutely convinced that, you know, Zeta Reticuli and all the rest of it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they, they would always get a fair, you know, that they weren't investigated by professional medical people or psychologists or anything like that. So, I've met a lot of sincere people. I'm not sure that they've always been served well by the people who investigated the cases afterwards. And I think some of that combination explains the stories that we read in the best-selling books that are out there. What, uh, what would you say? Uh, well, let me put it this way. What do you think the most Wait, we might have a call. Let me just see. Yes, we do. We have a call. I'm going to, I'm going to, and we have two lines. I'm going to remember that thought um, and and I'll get back to you with that thought if that comes up. And we have uh, Ken calling from Los Angeles. Ken, you are live on the air. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, you know, um, that at this point, uh, with all of the revelations with the military and the fact that people have been seeing these objects in our skies for literally thousands of years, I think we have gone so far beyond whether they're real or whether or not, you know, they're um, some, um, another government. We, you know, again, it's something that we as a public don't really know what it is, but we know that there are people in our government who do know what it is. So I think we, sh we should move past morons like this guy here and only bring in people who are going to expand our knowledge as opposed to um, hindering you know, and, and, and hanging on to this ridiculous notion that, that, that what people are seeing isn't what they're seeing. Well, hold it, Ken. Okay, so just, just, be, just be respectful, though, Ken, okay? No, no, it, it's... Uh, no, 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 I, no, no, see, at this point, because what this guy, he never respects the other witnesses. He wants to try and tell people that what they saw isn't what they saw. So, so yeah, I have no respect for morons, for... All right. Well, uh, that's no, it. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one, Martin, because I'm, okay. I'm well aware that I'm talking to, you know, I'm, I'm well, well aware that I'm talking to your audience and I listen to enough of your podcast to know what that's about. So first of all, I'm not, I, I've said a few times, I'm probably one of the people who would say more often than not, I, I genuinely don't know. We have, we don't have UFOs to study. We have reports of UFOs. Reports come from people. Okay. And I'm not trying to, in fact, Again, I would say the complete opposite. I'm, I'm trying to expand some of the arguments about this, and that's the whole reason I'm throwing in, go and Google these people. You know, Look at Gerard Tuft and his ideas about a deterministic universe, i.e. we're being led towards understanding things, but sometimes the way that we're being led doesn't make sense to us beyond just what we can see. That, that's a possibility, and you know, I think that's a debate that, ufology should take on board a lot more um there are some amazing books that go and look at different areas of this you know reframing the debate which came out recently is a, a book where a bunch of academics throw ideas in and they're not being skeptical and you know i'm open to a lot of those ideas so i'm not telling people that i that they didn't see what they saw i've, I've said that a few times i've met witnesses i've met abductees i've, I've met sincere people um, and I'm not disputing the sincerity of it. I'm just not sure that 
I suppose the simple explanations where you try to put these all into a basket, I'm just not sure that they all fit. And I think sometimes when, when we try to do that, actually what we do, in the end it comes a cropper because they don't all, all these experiences don't fit in the same place. And I'm not doubting for a second that people see lights in the sky. Um, you know, if you look at Project Hestelen, I don't know how well that's known in the United States, for example. Pretty well. Yeah, pretty well. Yeah, but I met one of the researchers from that, Odd Gunnar Road, ages ago, and he's actually mentioned in my book. And I mean, how in one sense, they were very lucky. These were ufologists who went to investigate lights and they could expect to have sightings when they were there. There's no doubt, you know, the lights have been seen, all sorts of strange things have been seen, but the UFO debate often excludes now the things that were widely seen and sincerely seen in the past like nature spirits fairies stuff like that and yet a lot of those reports actually correspond very closely with what people are now explaining you know coming forward with, with this ufo reports so um joe simonton and his pancakes at eagle rock i don't know if people know that case particularly oh, yeah. well yeah yeah now that is utterly bizarre it actually has a lot more correspondence with the kind of nature spirits and stuff that people saw before and it has that weird thing that something some object that appears to have magical properties when you're dealing with the entity that gives it to you it turns out to be really mundane afterwards yeah um so just, just I, I would pancakes. disagree that i'm trying to shut the debate down i'm i'm actually saying when you look at how these things correspond to other strange events and you look at how those other strange events have been understood actually there's probably a lot more you can pour into this debate that will help us to understand it right okay well we have jeff jeff from indiana you're on the air jeff welcome to the show right okay well we have hello hey, oh, jeff. Jeff. am i on you are on you the are, air yes. as i said yes <laughs> okay uh, i just want to say uh i just can't believe it's uh the majority of the UFO shows, we spend more time being skeptics than we are examining the facts, you know. And this man here, I have respect for him and everything. But if uh, one thing I got to say right off the bat is, if you have mis mistaken a mosquito for a Spitfire and a seagull's rear end for any sort of an aircraft, you need glasses. Well, I, I have to tell you that a lot of people. I will tell you this, Jeff, that. Uh, it's very common that birds and seagulls flying at night that are catching light. Uh, people have reported that many, many times, just uh, the knowledge that I have on this. No, uh, well, Jeff, you know, uh, Spitfires, okay, that's that's nonsense. No, no, Jeff, you, you, you I've didn't... I've got to do these things as you possibly can have in broad daylight, 40 feet from my face. I could have hit them with a rock. They are machines. They are engulfed in a plasma field, some sort of a plasma, uh, extreme voltage. You can, if you see them from right underneath, the, the uh, force field is as intense. You can see the components of a machine inside. And um, they're real. I, I'm not saying they're extraterrestrial, but I can tell you they're machines. Now, if they are government, uh, boy, are we really being lied to and, and being kept in the stone age but they have machinery like this and we're still riding around with the cars and internal combustion engines but they're totally silent i saw four of these uh crafts machines uh for quite a while in broad daylight there was a tree a tree right there uh, that I uh, estimated the next day when I went back and thought about the whole situation. It was about 30 feet tall, and they, they cleared this tree about 10 feet. So this is how close they were. And uh, the most eerie point of it is that, that they're totally silent. If you wouldn't have looked up, you'd have never know, knew they went over you. But they are brilliantly colored. They're absolutely beautiful to look at. But they are a machine. There are machine components that you can see inside the force field. Uh, most people say, why are the photos always blurred? It's because they are blurred. This, this, uh, this ionic uh, or uh, plasma field around this, this machine makes it look like it's fuzzy. 
uh, I think when they power down is when they actually come out and you can see the disc or whatever shape they are actually in. But there is an absolute uh, plant for force field on the outside of them. But I just wish, it just disheartens me to hear all the skepticism from people when there's been thousands of people, thousands and thousands. In other words, we got a bunch of people out here that have no idea what they're looking at. You know, and they, they, it's it's just disheartening to discredit uh, the rapid police officers and everybody else that come out and see these things. And it's becoming more prevalent. Um, that's all I got I, to say. I'd just rather see more positive right. talk about it because they're real for crying out loud. They're real. All yeah. right. Thank thank you for the call. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say a couple of quick things about what Jeff yeah, was sure. saying? So yeah. I, we have, I'm we have well another one on the line. I, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. When I talk about this, so, you know, you, you, you introduced me as a skeptic and, and I am more skeptically minded. But a couple of things. First of all, simply the the mosquito and the spitfire. I made that clear. That was a split second, you know, that that, that happened. And it was quite a useful thing because it just it just shows you that sometimes the thing you're looking at, if you expect to see something, you see what you expect, not what's there. And, you know, it, it, it was... I spent longer talking about it than it took to figure it out. It was just like that. So, and those mm -hmm. kind of things happen all the time. Secondly, Jeff's story is interesting. And I've met, you know, just over the years, I've met quite a lot of people who've seen structured craft close to. I remember I was at an event once where a guy from the Raelians was talking and, and they've got a, they're a religious group and they've got a particular view about UFOs. And somebody got up and reported at that meeting sincerely that, that he'd basically seen the same craft that's in George Adamski's book, right, um, which has been widely discredited. And I cannot explain, I can't make sense in my own mind about, we have loads of sincere reports, the craft that are seen resemble each other, but at the same time, they all have idiosyncrasies and they're different and they change over time. Um, and that's one thing that keeps me going. And, you know, if Jeff were at a conference that I was at, I'm, I'd be interested to hear the story. But um, I I don't know. And, and you know, over the years, I've heard so many of those stories and they correspond and yet they all have slight differences. So I struggle to make sense of all those with one easy explanation. Very good. Well, uh, thank you. We have, uh, let's see. Oh, Elton. Elton from Oakland. Is it hey. must be the Elton I know from Oakland. How are you, Elton? That's, that's right. It, it certainly is. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one yeah. thing, um one 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 thing make sure you excuse got, me, Elton. Uh, Elton. Hang on. Yeah. Just mute your mute your computer or whatever you're listening to, please. Oh, I'm sorry. You know the uh Incident. I'd like to see what uh, he thinks about uh, Chaz Clark's in New South Wales in 2016. That was an amazing event. And also the West Australia school phenomenon incident mm -hmm. where so many witnesses corroborated they saw the same thing. Yeah, we're, we're getting but, feedback uh, from you, Elton, there. So I don't know if yeah, you got I, something I, I playing in the background. All right, I'm I'm sorry. I had to mute um, until you get that figured out. Yeah, I, uh, do so you want I, to answer? I didn't actually. If I'm if I'm honest, I didn't. I I got that he was talking about a couple of Australian cases, including the the famous school case in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, Westall. Uh huh. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. I'm if I'm honest, I'm not that up on the Australian cases to want to talk about them in great detail, other than um, the, 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 the Westall school one. It's, it, again, it's multiple witnesses, isn't it? And, you know, it's... Yeah, it's um, like a couple hundred witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's up there with the miracle of Fatima or something like that, where a lot of people see that. I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, in fact... On that one, I don't know enough to make an intelligent comment, so I'd, I'd, I'd rather not, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, right. Elton, anything else? If you're familiar, yeah, one other quick one. The the Chaz Clark incident, I, I think you had her on your show in New South Wales in 2000. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, it's uh, I I can't pronounce the name of that incident, but are you familiar with with her, Chaz Clark? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I'm I'm not. If if I'm brutally yeah. honest with you, I'm, it, I'm it not. happened in South Wales, and it was a, it's quite a crazy, incredible story. I don't know, uh, you know, with the military involved, and supposedly there was some uh, shooting down of some type of craft or something. One to really look into if um, if you okay. want to really look into a mystery. That's quite quite a story. If you want to check that one out. Okay. So I'm yeah. going to tell you. I'm going to tell so, so, you, I'm, Neil, I'm, that I'm you sorry, can. Jim, go- nice to speak to you. And so, sorry to disappoint you on that. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm no. familiar. Yeah. You know, with a lot of cases, the the Australian ones less. So. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm 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 quite familiar with a few Australian cases, but not those particularly. Yeah. Uh, that one is one I'm going to tell you to Google. You know how you told a few people to Google. I'm, you may want I'm to Google that one. as we go, yeah. actually. So yeah. many reputable witnesses on that one, too, and so many military people involved. Oh, my God. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Mm. Hey, well, Elton, I'm good to hear your voice. Thank, Thank you for the call. You, too. All right. Yeah. Good night. All right. So uh, we do. We could take one more caller if someone would like to call in. That number's up on the screen. 855-472-5483. So uh, right before I took the first call, I said I would remember what I was going to say. And it's basically, uh, what would you consider the most compelling case of all the ones you've looked into? What What is the big question mark for you? What, the big question mark? Yeah, the biggest um, question mark of all the cases well, it, that yeah, you've so looked it, into. It, it depends. Um, in terms of, Everything that's ever happened, um, I'm going to disappoint you on this one. I think the wow signal, because there's no, even Brian Dunning can't dismantle that. So it must be good, right? Um, I mean, I, I wasn't I'm, expecting gonna... that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, 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 but in was the that sense... 1978 or 73? Or no, something? no. F- 15th of August 1977. I've, look, I've even got a joke explanation for it in my book. It's the day before Elvis died, right? I just ah. wonder if the Space Brothers were calling back their representative, you know. Um, but but, but the, the point of the joke is that that's as good an explanation as any. 42-second signal, we don't know what it was. The accidental causes on Earth have largely been discounted. So that, to me, is one of the more compelling things. And also, um, if you think about extraterrestrial life, the the... We may have discovered phosphine gas on Venus, which might mean that there's microbial life out there. Again, I think that's that. Yeah, you know, that's quite compelling. There are some amazing cases. I, I know I come over as a skeptic, and I deliberately kind of come on shows like this and you know rev it up a bit because it, it tends to drive traffic through my website later on. It, <laughs> it, 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 you're self-serving. It tends to get, you're self-serving uh, skeptic. It, it, yeah. Well, no, but but it, but it also see, it, it tends to get me bookings for gigs and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, I don't do gigs in America at the moment. It's a bit of a hike with with COVID and stuff. But you know, I've, I've oh. spoken to people online over there. Um, I, so, in terms of great cases, I was asked to produce a top ten when I did the book, the top ten of British cases. I think the Deckmont Woods case in Britain is the best by by a mile. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's, are you familiar with that one? No, nope, no, nope, I, right. I can't say and you, I may, once you start talking about it, I mean, we do have someone on hold just to let you know for a call, but let's go. Oh, sorry, that Jack, quickly. you know, I, you know, what? I was, I even called Elton Jeff when well, no, that was a, I'm sorry, Elton, if you're still listening, mate. Um, but really simply with it, with the Deckmont Woods case for my, for my money, that's the best one. And it's, I don't know the, the answer on this one, but. A forester, 9th of November 1979, was going about his work. He had a bizarre experience where a UFO that was hovering in front of him that was translucent. He could see through it, but it was definitely there. Um, It released two other small objects that flew through the air towards him. Um, And they, they resembled like World War II sea mines. He lost consciousness. He suffered some physical and sort of mental damage and what's great about the case is that um i mean obviously it wasn't great if you were him but um what's great about the case is that because he got home very quickly and his wife reported it within a short amount of time his doctor came to check him out and you know confirmed that he he'd obviously been through some traumatic event and the local police turned up 
and they treated it as an assault. So there was a full forensic investigation. And I do remember this case yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his trousers are now the biggest holy relic in British ufology. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they belong to a guy called Malcolm Robinson, who did the investigation. He's now the legal owner of the trousers. And I'm not alone in having had my hands in Bob Taylor's trousers at some point. Because <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, like splinters of the true cross, you know, you, you've got to touch them for it to really work, make sense. But yeah, he's, um, but seriously, there's, I won't bore you with the whole thing, but the way the trousers were torn was unusual. I mean, something strange happened to him and nobody knows. And what there's a brilliant book written about it by Malcolm Robinson. And what's great about the book is that he gives you the case. He gives you 16 explanations that may, you know, to a greater or lesser extent may explain it. And it's for my money, that's the best British case. Uh, and it, and it, if you're unfamiliar in America, it's easily Googled. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take this uh, this call really quick. Jack uh, from Ohio, yeah. you are on the line and you are on the air. Hey, Martin. Hi. We got just uh, two minutes here. Okay. Hey, Martin. Hey, Neil. How you doing? Uh, my I quick have... question Hi, is... Jack. Oh, okay. Uh, Luis Salazondo. Oh, what, yeah. what, are you asking me what I think about him? Yeah, Luis Elizondo and what he has to say, um, just his point of view and the people that, you know, study this, that, you know, know about aircraft and, you know, just what they're seeing, you know, like he's basically saying that what he's saying is definitely not, a, you know, regular aircraft that we would have or any other um, nation would have. Well, your... I, I, I spoke about that quite a bit earlier on. I mean, so given that we've only got a few minutes, I think possibly something we could agree on here is that if Luis Elizondo actually delivers on the much longer video and the other bits and pieces, I'd be really, despite what one of the earlier callers thought, I would love that to be true. I, would, I think they're presenting intriguing evidence. I've been around and... You know, I've seen the great cases in, in ufology and the, the ones that were always going to convince the out and out skeptics were presented and a lot of them crashed and burned. So that's why I'm maybe more skeptical about the three videos and, and the, the promise of other stuff. And we haven't talked about it tonight, but uh, there's a guy mentioned in my book, a bloke called Ralph Noyes, N-O-Y-E-S, who was in, in UK ufology for years. I mentioned him in the context of Luis Alessandro because Ralph Noyes was a ministry of, he was, spent a lifetime in the Ministry of Defence and he left with a very high rank. And I remember him telling us at, at, at a, a, a research meeting one time that, you know, he'd seen videos that have never been made public. He, he was convinced of two things. Number one, that the British military knew that there was strange phenomena out there to be investigated. Number two, that they'd concluded they were not extraterrestrial. And Ralph saw gun camera footage, which is known to exist from a military fighter of a strange object in the sky. And he saw this in 1970. Um, and it's never I, been. I, I hate to have to do this to you, but we are right out of time and another live show is coming up. So uh, but thank you so much for your participation, participation tonight. OK. All right. Th thank so you very much. Thanks, everybody, even the ones that weren't convinced by me. All right. All right. <laughs> Speak soon. All right. Yeah. Cheers, Martin. Yes. Take care now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go well. All right, everyone. So that's it for our show this evening. Thanks for watching or listening, however you're doing it. And next week, I'll be on the West Coast, but I have Dr. Bob Gross on the show. And so thanks once again for everyone behind the scenes and all the those who support the show. Remember to keep your eyes to the sky.